Fentanyl is super dangerous and it's dealed in the hundreds of grams out here in open drug markets. I get a 24th Street BART stop in San Francisco, but I use it every day in the operating room and patients get really nervous and concerned when I tell them that I'm gonna be giving them fentanyl. They may even have a little mini anxiety attack and that's the last thing I want from patients who are already really anxious and nervous before their surgery because of the effects of anxiety on anesthesia and surgery safety. So why is fentanyl so dangerous out there but so safe in here when I'm giving it? We'll talk about the dose of fentanyl that I use versus the dose out there, what it does to your body and brain, and what happens to your body if you use fentanyl out there if you come into the operating room for surgery. Fentanyl is a synthetic opioid, meaning that it's man-made because the original opium actually comes from the unripe seed from the poppy plant. We don't use that in medicine. Instead, we use fentanyl because it's a powerful analgesic. An analgesic is a painkiller, like ibuprofen or Tylenol. But opioid analgesics are very different than ibuprofens and Tylenols because of the effects that they have in your brain. They're very fat-soluble and they cross the blood-brain barrier and they're affected in your brain is to slow down your breathing. They can slow down your breathing all the way to the point that you stop breathing, and that's why Narcan, or naloxone, is so popular and effective as an antidote to fentanyl and opioid overdoses. Thousands of doses of naloxone, or Narcan, go out to the community in San Francisco, and that's because naloxone, or Narcan, is a reversal of opioids, including synthetic ones like fentanyl. So if somebody is overdosed from opioids like fentanyl, naloxone can help revive them and help them start to breathe again to prevent that overdose from leading to death. I'll use naloxone in the operating room rarely if the patient may have gotten too much opioid and they're not waking up on time after the surgery is over. But you have to be really careful giving naloxone in the operating room because these patients just had surgery. And if you take away the effect of the opioids in their body and their brain, they might wake up in excruciating pain. So if I ever do give naloxone in the operating room, it's in very, very small doses because I don't want the patients to wake up extremely angry and in pain. We have lots of other anesthesia medications like the white stuff that I'm holding here. The white stuff is propofol and it can totally stop your breathing like in the Michael Jackson case. But fentanyl is different because it does not affect the rest of your body's functioning the way that propofol and the anesthesia gases do like the ones that come out of the ventilator behind me. So we use fentanyl fentanyl at very high doses for surgeries like cardiac surgery when the rest of the brain and body can't tolerate general anesthesia medications like the gases or like high doses of propofol. But like I said, if you get high doses of fentanyl, you'll stop breathing. And that's why in anesthesia, we have so many airway tools and breathing tubes to support your breathing when you're under anesthesia. Things like the oral airway here that goes just behind your tongue in the back of your mouth. Or like this laryngeal mask apparatus that also goes in the back of your mouth behind your tongue when we connect you to a ventilator. Sometimes we just put the mask over your mouth to give you extra oxygen if you're not breathing very well because of the fentanyl on board. And of course, there's the endotracheal tube that goes past your vocal cords to support your breathing if you're fully paralyzed for surgery. The doses of fentanyl that I use in the operating room are tiny compared to the doses of fentanyl that are dealt out on the streets. In San Francisco, for example, multiple dealers have been found carrying hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of grams of fentanyl. This little vial here of fentanyl only has 100 micrograms. That's less than one thousandth of a gram. And these drug dealers are carrying hundreds of grams. That's totally different doses. It used to be that you could have over 500 grams of fentanyl with multiple offenses under your name and still have relatively less severe consequences for that. Now, Brick Jenkins has made that five grams. But five grams of fentanyl, how does that compare to what I'm giving patients in the operating room? Remember that patients are getting micrograms of fentanyl. At most for a major cardiac surgery, it might be a thousand micrograms or one milligram. And I don't think that anyone's specifically measuring out micrograms of fentanyl when they're carrying hundreds of grams of this stuff. So what happens to your body in the operating room if it's ever seen fentanyl or other drugs before? The body relatively quickly develops tolerance to everything from opioids to marijuana to alcohol and even prescription medications like benzodiazepines, the most famous one being Xanax. And we need to account for that change in tolerance in the operating room so that you're not overdosed or underdosed. So when you need them in the operating room, you'll need whopping doses to get the same effect 
as somebody who's had an opioid naive brain or like a virgin brain if you want to think about it that way. And those higher doses of medications do carry side effects. For example, if you need double the dose of propofol because you've been using marijuana every day for the past many years, there's higher chances of heart side effects from those whopping high doses of propofol. And that's why techniques like nerve blocks, epidurals, and spinals are so powerful in patients who have very high tolerances to these general anesthesia medications. Because those nerve blocking techniques actually block the connection from your brain to where the surgery is happening. So no matter what your tolerance is to fentanyl or to propofol or to gas, if your brain isn't seeing the pain from the surgery because we've blocked the nerve connection, you may not need any of these opioid medications at all. I've done plenty of videos on nerve blocks and epidurals, so you can check those out as well. But don't forget that the drugs you use outside the operating room aren't the only things that impact your anesthesia requirements and your safety here in surgery. Your mental health plays a huge role in how much anesthesia you need, how much pain you're gonna feel, how much nausea you might have, and the risk of other complications. More anxiety, for example, can wind up your brain and possibly increase your anesthesia requirements and make the pain you feel worse when you wake up from surgery. Your anxiety alone might wind up your brain so much that it might look like your brain is tolerant to these medications. And that's the power of your mental health, even in the operating room. And it's also a powerful way to make your surgery more comfortable and to reduce your pain without needing more medications. And let's not forget that mental health disorders also have a huge overlap with substance use. The more depressed patients are, the greater the likelihood that they've used some sort of substance in the past to self-medicate for their mental health condition. And all of these have very real effects that we see on your brain and your body when you're in the operating room for surgery. So I take BART to work pretty frequently. And every day I'm on it, I ask myself how we got in this mess and how do we get ourselves out of it? And just like how we need to hold police officers and doctors and other members of society accountable for their jobs, we need to be accountable for our own health and ultimately feel empowered to take back control of our bodies. Otherwise, we can't make a dent in the mental health and substance use tragedy that we're living in here every day. The same way that I use love and compassion and care to help my patients in the most vulnerable and frightening moments of their lives before surgery is how we need to address this major tragedy and crisis around the opioid epidemic here in San Francisco and in other cities across the country. It's not meant to be harsh, it's meant to recognize the resources that we need to take back control of our health and our bodies because you have more control over your body than you've probably ever been told.